Tonight's webinar, uh, presented by HFA Dads in Action, is called Hemophilia in School Success, Navigating the System. Our presenter is Joby Robinson. Joby has her PhD from the University of Georgia with a double major in special education and psychology. She has more than 20 years of experience as a teacher and trainer. Joby is the lead author of a curriculum, Building Cultural Bridges, which was cited by the President's Commission on Race as one of the 21st century's outstanding programs, and is featured by uh, Teaching Tolerance. If you're interested to see that, you could check it out at www.tolerance.org slash magazine slash number 14 fall 1998 better hyphen together. Uh, Joby has provided training at the national and international level on topics including leadership, communication, conflict management, attention deficit disorder, and positive parenting. She has her own consulting business, Joby Robinson Consulting which you can find at www.jobyrobinson.org. And she's a trainer for Triple P America. She's also on the faculty with the U.S. Department of Justice's Leadership Institute and is a regular speaker. And until recently, Joby was a co-investigator of a four-year Duke Endowment grant that provided psychosocial services to children with cancer and blood disorders at the Palmetto Health Children's Hospital in Columbia, South Carolina. And I know Joby has lots of great information to present tonight, so we will turn it over to her. Thank you, Jane. I'm very glad to be with all of you, and thank you so much for inviting me. Um, if you would go to the next slide. That is a picture of my dog we had to put him to sleep, but his name is Chance, and it's with a little boy who's now probably about 21. But I put this slide up just to talk briefly about what we're going to uh, go over this evening. Uh, the first is tips for successful advocacy. And sometimes uh, advocacy can be exchanged with the word assertive, because you really have to stand up for your rights sometimes, but that means not putting other people down. And sometimes that can be a hard one. Um, some people that are more aggressive think they're assertive when actually they're aggressive. So we're going to be talking about how to be assertive um, to help our children. Um, and to teach our children advocacy and assertiveness skills as well. And that's thinking out of the box. So with Chance, we, um, my graduate student with the Deep Endowment uh, Funds went to visit a little boy who had a bleeding disorder in a very rural town. And this little boy was very, very um, unhappy. And he uh, was aggressive, but he wouldn't talk. He wouldn't talk to anybody about what he was going through. And then we found out through Julie, my graduate student, that he loved animals. And that's what he wanted to do as a career. So she got him set up as a volunteer uh, at an animal shelter on the weekends and took Chance every week to visit this little boy. And by watching Chance, he realized how to stay in control and how to uh, delay gratification to drink water, how to go after everything you can with all you got. Um, so, you know, the idea here tonight is there's no recipe for how to help our children. Uh, we need to be assertive and kind of think out of the box and, and work together. So in addition to that uh, advocacy piece, we'll be looking at the laws and we'll also be looking at resiliency. You know, we used to think that people were born resilient. And maybe some people are born with the cup half full right off, but we also know you can learn and you can teach resiliency to be able to handle life's challenges. And we'll be talking about that as well. Jane? You can go to the next one. There we go. All right. So uh, because we had to uh, quiet everybody's audio tonight, we're going to do a couple of questions and in a poll format. And if you'll bear with me one second here, we'll get the first one going. Just to find out a little bit about who is out there joining us tonight. So if you could cast your vote on there, we'll leave it open just for 30 seconds or so. All right, we're almost at 100%. If anybody else wants to cast the last vote or two or three, you've got a couple of seconds, and then we're going to 
close the poll. All right. All right, so we are obviously predominantly in that elementary school um, audience tonight uh, with some preschoolers. And um, I actually have a 20-year-old, so I'm in that 50, <laughs> 15 plus. And uh, Sandra, one of our other organizers, is also a mom of, of a child with hemophilia. Uh, her son is 10. So, uh, but it looks like we're we're mainly focused on the six to 10-year-olds, but we certainly want to address some uh, some preschool or kindergarten issues as well. Thank you, everyone. Okay, that, yes, that's very helpful. Thank you. Okay, next slide. All right, so we, we do need to deal with the idea that children with chronic health conditions are more at risk for adjustment difficulties. That doesn't mean they are, they have them all 100%, but they certainly are more at risk. And that could be in academics, emotional, behavioral, social. Um, research has shown that health needs may be, um, that, are, that is one of the strongest predictors of academic achievement. So we'll talk about some of the things that go along with that. but. Um, that is certainly something we need to educate teachers about because a lot of times children are kind of at the intersections of the health, um, health um, area and the academics. Uh, the schools often take care of the health issues but don't realize there can be some issues with academics and emotional behavioral and social relationships as well. Next. So they are possibly at risk due to what? Well, a lot of times there's increased absences. And we know even if you get homebound, it's no, um, no substitute for seat time. There can be pain and anxiety associated with that, sometimes impaired stamina, fatigue, uh, the side effects from the treatment themselves. So sometimes our children go to school or have to stay at home and, and are not feeling very well. So it certainly means they're not always up to par for um, all the homework and tests and that kind of thing. So, of course, we'll be talking about the laws that, that help them be able to um, be on the same page as the other children. Um, of course, another issue that I didn't put up there is just being different. Most kids, you know, don't want to stand out. Uh, they do maybe when they're older or uh, adults, but children like to fit in and they like to um, it's hard for them if they feel like they're being different. So with activities, sometimes our children have to sit on the sidelines. We know that. Um, the needles, the crutches, the wheelchairs sometimes, and bruises uh, make them stick out. And that makes it uh, harder for them with their friends. Next slide. Um, hey, Jamie, I, I, mean, I did you too early. OK, I was looking for another one, but I might not get it. That's OK. Um, so educating school personnel about hemophilia. Um, of course, visiting the HTC can provide you with a lot of information with the school. I know when I worked at Palmetto Health Hospital here in Columbia, South Carolina, I, um, we did a real thorough handout, so I hope you have handouts that uh, the HTC provides for you. And if not, um, I encourage you to make one for yourself. And we do need to ask that you have a meeting every year at the beginning of the year. I have parents that I remember you said, please, tell me no, not another meeting. I have to have one every year. And yes, it, it does need to be every year, because the 504, if that's what you end up getting, also has to be developed every year. Um, but when you do meet with the staff, um, I, just several things to keep in mind. Um, who to invite. You know, it's real important that you get the right people at the table. So um, it's, it's good to work with a guidance counselor or, or the teacher or the nurse to make sure that everybody that is involved with this child is there. Um, so even someone from the district office might be good to get to know your family and your child. And of course, keep it brief. I've been to meetings before uh, representing the HTC, and uh, they were really too long. We've got to remember teachers are, are just struggling with the time. So trying to keep it brief, having handouts, being organized, don't jump topics. And I think the next slide, Jane, um, talks about a little bit about what to have, uh, what to bring with you. 
So you want to encourage discussion and questions and work collaboratively, of course, to find common ground. And as we talked about, thinking outside the box. Um, and helping teachers realize the impact that hemophilia can have um, on areas other than academics. I know um, I'm not sure about your experience with um, having meetings with teachers, but I know we did a, a survey in South Carolina several years ago, and we asked the team, we put all the chronic health conditions, uh, the major ones, down, and, and hemophilia was one. And we asked the um, teachers to write them which ones they were most comfortable with and which ones they were least comfortable with. And uh, the ones that they were least comfortable with was hemophilia. So it still frightens people and there's a lot of myths out there unfortunately that we're going to have to deal with and want to teach our children how to manage as well. But the bottom line, we need our school staff to feel confident and that, to know that, that um, you're going to support them. Um, if they're not asking you any questions, it might be because they are nervous or anxious or worried about asking the right questions. So it's important to use how and what questions with them. So like after you have explained and you've given out their information, you know, you can use a how or what question like, uh, what are some issues of, of concern for you? Um, how can I support you? So um, that's a little strategy that I've used a lot is asking how and what questions so you can get out from them the concerns or issues that they, they might have. Um, so I, did I say be positive? Yeah, I said be positive, of course, and, um, and smile. And the, try, the bottom line is to give them enough information so they can take care of your child but not, not in, threaten them so they'll feel good about working with your child. So the next, and I believe it's another question, Jane. All right. Oh, two questions. Oh. Good. I'm having fun with this poll feature. <laughs> All right. Have you set up a school meeting yet this year? If everyone could vote, we'll leave that open for 30 seconds or so. All right, we'll close that poll and share the results. There you go, Joby. 60% okay. have either set up or already, already had a school meeting this year. So kudos to you. Oh, good for you. Parents, that's for really great. being on the ball. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. And I know some schools are starting uh, later or earlier. And uh, sometimes parents want to let the children be in the school maybe a few days to get to know the teacher. So. I just encourage all of you to, to have a meeting and don't feel shy about asking them to meet with you. It's, it's really important. Are we going to be able to do the next one? And then, yeah, so in uh, the next was what services do you want for your child this year? If you could just select all that apply. Um, and I'm sorry, I didn't put in a I'm not sure. So maybe if you're, if you're not sure because you're, you're going to learn a little tonight about what services might be applicable, um, then I guess you could check off none. And I'll just say while we're, while we're waiting for the last few to hear, we, we did get a, not a question but a comment that we have parents on the line whose five-year-old is entering kindergarten tomorrow and um, and then I, I, I got a message from a dad who's joined us on the phone um, but is not on the system so um, and his son is, is entering high school so we're covering wow. quite, the, good. quite the range Big guys them off. yeah so let's share those results looks like 504 is an IEP Okay, interesting. Well, that's great. And we're going to talk about all of these tonight, so very good. We can go to the next slide. Okay, so just a summary of what school staff we think need to know. Um, certainly basic facts about hemophilia 
severity of bleeds, caring for bleeds, treating, school attendance, and most importantly, how hemophilia affects your child's school experience. A little bit about his or her temperament and, and how she's managed the hemophilia and reactions to it. And then, of course, participating in PE. Um, you know, go to the next slide if you would, Jane. Thank you. So fitness in school is, is so important in, in life. We're realizing how important it is. It used to be, of course, healthcare professionals strictly forbade physical activities, you know, for people with bleeding disorders, and they were all afraid. As a matter of fact, I remember going down to Orangeburg, which is a very rural town about um, an hour and a half from Columbia, where, where I live, and it's the capital. And I went to visit a little child that was first grade with a bleeding disorder. Um, and she uh, had been wearing a helmet at PE since she was a little kid, you know, since she was in a four-year-old program. So they still had her in a helmet and was not letting her play with the other children. So it's amazing how far we've really come and looked at the benefits of physical activity. Um, what does it do, of course, stronger muscles and joints, able to withstand, withstand st stress and st uh, strain improved flexibility, improved endurance. We know it releases endorphins and um, serotonin, which can ease stress and tension. And then it's healthy because of the weight maintenance. Uh, being overweight, of course, can put stress on the joints, um, improved coordination, improved mental health, as we already mentioned. So it is so important. We need to help our PE teachers understand that we want our children to get uh, physical activity. And, and if there is a bleed, you know, uh, to make sure they are able to participate in some way and, and don't feel different about that. Um, there was a study by, done with doctors and uh, asking what the top ten sports recommended by doctors were for children with bleeding disorders. We didn't make this into a question, I don't think, Jane. But um, they do recommend, 100% of the doctors recommended swimming. And for the sport, least uh, riskiest sport, uh, of course, it was boxing, then football. Um, so we've got to remember to try to find a, a activity that they can do that is also appropriate for them. But the good news is that physical activity and fitness and uh, will help the child be strong and have less bleeds. Next. Okay, so school attendance. We know regular school is, is so important, and um, we also know that many of our children miss a lot of days. And as I said, even if you have homebound, it's no substitute for seat time. So um, teachers uh, with hemophilia should take the child self-report if they do indicate that they are having a bleed. And we hope that no child is um, felt to be um, not telling the truth, but we've got to expect that a child if they're having a bleed during the classroom, that they feel comfortable to be able to tell the teacher. Um, and, the, and if it does come out that, that they're using it as an excuse, which I actually, in all the years I worked with children, I never had that happen. Um, you can certainly deal with that um, by having them talk to you or the teacher or, or counselor if it ended up being that way. Um, but it's important that children are in school if they can. And if, if they do have a bleed, Having a place in the school is, is important where they can go and take some pain meds, rest, uh, and be able to stay in school would be important. But let's look at homebound for a few minutes. Next slide. So uh, each state has its own procedural guidelines for homebound, but um, there are two types, and I'm sure you know this, intermittent and regular. And most of the kids, when I was at the hospital where I worked, um, did intermittent, and they did it as a matter of, matter of um, course. I mean, every every when school was starting up, we were all doing intermittents just for everybody, it seems like, because it's nice to have it in place, because those of you that have gotten it before know that sometimes it can take quite a while to go through the school office and the district office and get all the signatures. So we like to go ahead and do it at the beginning. If you don't ever need it, that's great. But if you do, it's there for you. And regular homebound is more for um, if they're going to have an operation or if you know there's something, they're going to be out for a long time, then that's for a set number of days. And it's arranged when the child is absent. So that's basically the difference between those two. So next slide. Let's look for a minute about what the responsibilities of the student are. Because I think it's good to go 
go through that with the child so they know that you expect them to go to school regularly if they can. Uh, you want them to be comfortable communicating their needs to the teacher, and that might mean you role play it with them. I know we did a lot of role playing at our hospital uh, with um, little kids and with teenagers, being able to tell their teacher um, or tell the help the nurse, you know, how they feel, what they need. It's important for them to feel comfortable, and sometimes role play and practice can really help. Next slide. Of course, handling, handing in all homework assignment, that's really the child's responsibility. And the more we can have them feel that responsibility, uh, the better for transition for when they get older and can learn to be more independent. Next slide. Well, what are the responsibilities of the school staff? Certainly to respect the student's privacy and confidentiality about the chronic health condition. That's really up to the child and the family, but it is something you need to talk about. Often I found with younger kids, they were fine about it and talked about different things very openly, but as the kids get older, sometimes they're less uh, apt to self-disclose. And, and that's a good thing, too, because they realize there's some kids that I'm very close to that I want to give this information to, but there's some that are more acquaintances that I really don't want them knowing this information. So it's a good thing to be able to talk to your child about at different ages and stages. Um, but school staff do need to understand they do have to comply with the student's health care plan, which we'll be talking about as a state uh, guidelines. And they do need to monitor the student's progress, not just in academics, as I said, but help if you're able to let them know to also be aware of any behavioral, or social, or emotional issues so you can do something about it before it becomes a problem, if that's the case. Next. Of course, it's important to maintain open communication and with parents, and, and that's part of their responsibility as well as the parent. And we know it's about relationships. So the more you can have positive interactions with the teacher or you have the luxury of being able to, to volunteer in the class or do something that, you know, when they go on a, a retreat or whatever, it's all about relationships uh, that parents and teachers can have to help open that communication up. Um, so, yes, I believe that's what I was going to say about that one. We move to the next one. Challenges. I know um, usually I would be asking when people are very upset with each other, so that's why I'm saying to have ongoing communication because it's sometimes stressful, you know, if teachers are having um, their own issues uh, and parents are having their own issues when you don't agree, it's hard to come together sometimes. So. Um, you can always ask somebody from the HTC to come with you. Um, I used to go to many an IEP or 504 meeting. Uh, if you don't have that, you can ask for a friend that um, understands the situation and be a good advocate. And I guess I have to just re realize a lot of times you have to um, really calm yourself down. You know, I know grandma's rule count to 10. That really means a lot because you're in a meeting and it's, not going where you're wanting to and you get tense or nervous, um, sometimes not being able to self-regulate and control your emotions is very important. So count to 10, it's like um, the caveman back in the day, you know, basically it was um, either freeze or, um, or, or attack, right, or withdraw, and uh, we still have that part of our brain. It's in the back of our brain. Uh, and it's called the reptilian part of our brain. And that's when we get in trouble sometimes. We say things we don't want, didn't mean, wish we hadn't. But uh, Grandma's rule, if you count to 10, the blood actually goes from the back of the brain to the top front of the brain, which is the neocortex of the brain. And that's the executive center. And I even teach children. I've taught uh, children, five-year-old children about that because they're real intrigued with the reptilian part of your brain. But it's true, if you count to 10 and try to self-regulate, then hopefully you can think about, well, what do I really want here? What do we have in common? How, how can we get on the same side for, for this child? I know in particularly um, adversarial situations, I've brought a picture of the child. But sometimes you can get into such turfdom areas, and I, I do say this is not typical, but, you know, we kind of forget about who we're there for. So, um, you know, bringing your child is another um, possibility uh, you need to think about is, 
is it going to be appropriate if we are upset? Uh, that might be not a good time to come or just stay for part of it um, and teach him how to uh, advocate and be a good model for that. So sometimes the plan is agreed upon, but it's not implemented. And it doesn't mean that teachers don't want to in, in, uh, implement it. You know, you'd have to get with them to find out what the obstacles are. But um, anytime there's uh, two or three people in the room, everybody's going to have their different perspective. So it's important at these meetings to, to come at it um, remembering that we're all in it for the, for the child. Next slide. Okay, so we talked about another challenge with home, homebound. We talked about homebound briefly. Um, it's, it's services are delivered inconsistently or ineffectively. Um, not a lot of good communication between the homebound teacher and the regular teacher. Um, so that can be frustrating. So again, um, the HTC might be able to help with that. I used to do that by getting the homebound teacher um, on the phone with the regular teacher. It's all about communication. And so if you see there's a problem with that homebound, you know, again, trying to get people together so they can get on the same page is, is important, and that's an important way to advocate for your child. Next slide. OK, did you get this question in the poll, James? Hello? Uh, yes, I did. One second here. OK, I was scared I wasn't on. <laughs> I was like, uh oh, something happened. No, I I muted I muted my line and okay. got to uh, go back to unmute. There we go. So I am I put this in here because I'm really interested to find out how how has your experience have been. Maybe you haven't had that many, but I'm hoping they've been good for you. This is Sandra. I'll jump in while Jane's uh, getting that poll question lined up. I, I would say that, I mean, I have a fifth grader this year with severe hemophilia and inhibitor, and it's been super great for us. We've had really good experiences because um, I think we, because we've started that process early the year before. Um, mm -hmm. So it's, it's about laying the groundwork. Yeah, that's great. Oh, good. Yeah, that's very positive that the majority has had very good experiences. Oh, that's wonderful. Well, good for um, you. That is excellent. But if, if, if the, the parent who has had a not very good experience um, wants to shoot off any comments or questions about that, um, I think everybody can learn from, you know, not, not just what goes smoothly and well, but also kind of where the hiccups are or where the challenges are. So if anyone oh. wanted to share about the the not so good experiences, um, I could bring those up to the, you could put it in the question box, please. Thank you. That's great. Okay, next slide. Okay, well let's talk over the laws. So there are basically four of them that impact children with bleeding disorders. So there's the Individualized Health Care Plan and then the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, which is called Section 504. Then the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, which is the Special Ed Act and then finally the Americans with Disability Act. So let's take them one at a time. So the individualized health care plan um, is each state has its own plan and each state lays out specific instructions. But every child with a health condition, and certainly we're talking about hemophilia, should have an individualized health care plan. It's usually inst inst initiated excuse me, by the school nurse. But if you haven't heard from the school nurse in the first week of school, then you need to initiate it yourself. But the school nurse is actually legally responsible for calling you and sitting down with you and developing that individualized health care plan. A lot of times parents um, will work with the HTC first uh, to, to get um, input into what ought to also be in the plan. Um, so that can be a really good idea, too. Um, if a student has a 504 plan or an IEP, they still need to have an in individual health care plan. So if the child has a 504 plan or an IEP, the health care can be included 
in either one of those, but it stands alone. And Joby, we had a uh, question from um, from the audience about IHPs, and that um, do does an individual health care plan have to have that title? Uh, their school gave us a paper called a request for health care services. Is that the same thing? Yes, it is. It is. Each state probably has their own um, individual title of it. So it sounds like that's the same. And so what we can do is look at the next slide and see what's in there. So as I said, in most cases, um, the nurse is the re one responsible for writing the plan. And what should be in it should be um, document the procedures, like what services are needed, certainly emergency protocol, pain management protocol, how are they going to train the staff, is it going to be just uh, the, kid, the, the staff that works with the child, are they going to do a whole in-service for the school, um, when it starts, periodic review dates. So all of that um, needs to be in the health care plan. Next. And um, as I said, set up an individual meeting with the school, invite everybody necessary, and make sure you get those PE teachers. And sometimes they're kind of hard to get, but it's really important that they're also included. Let's go to the next just for a minute and see if um, it, we've got some um, other things in there. No, I guess not. But in the health care plan, um, you can have accommodations like extra set of books, you know, rolling backpack, modified lockers, um, being able to take the elevator, um, any anything that impacts the health of the child can be written into the individualized health care plan. Okay, we'll go to that one. So before the individualized health care plan uh, came about, uh, most of the children with hemophilia were having a 504 plans. But really realizing that um, 504 really has more to do with education, a lot of children now with hemophilia, that, um, at least in our state, has been having the health care plans and not needing a 504. So let's go over what a 504 is now. Um, first of all, it's a civil rights law that just states you can't discriminate against anybody because of their gender, race, or culture, or disability. And the word disability is broadly defined because uh, all, all the um, chronic health conditions are termed disability, even though we don't consider uh, children with hemophilia to have a disability. It's broadly defined. So any program or service that receives federal financing must have a Section 504. So I know there weren't a lot of um, parents online tonight with, that have teenagers, but um, when they get ready to go to college, they can look, if they look at public colleges that and they're federally funded, they can still have a 504 in college. So in order to be eligible, the Section 504 team, and there's a team at every school, and there's a 504 representative that is at every school that is um, assigned that, that responsibility, they must establish that the disability, in this fact hemophilia, substantially limits, lim limits at least one or more major life activities. And in the definition, which I think I'll show you in just a minute, learning is one of them. So children with hemophilia often are able to also get a Section 504. So let's move to that one, the next one. Okay, so examples of accommodations for 504, and you'll see how these are different from the health plan. Flexibility in completing misassignments and tests due to medical absences, notes of missed lectures, additional time to make up tests, accommodations in PE. So these are um, accommodations that are not exclusive, but uh, as a matter of fact, they don't have any that said so this is a discrete group of accommodations. It's really up to the creativity and what the uh, child needs. So who is eligible? A child who has a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits at least one major life activity. And then they outline the life activities as walking and seeing and hearing and then learning, reading and writing. So um, I should have had in bold learning because that could clearly be one of them. But even walking, if they have a um, problem with the walking with the bleeds 
or writing their hands getting cramped or whatever. So basically, if the child has one of these um, areas that is substantially limits, and then the child is uh, able to have a 504. So let's go to the next slide. I think I put more examples. So and we have as a I question, said, Toby. So, so these could be could, so these could be temporary limitations. Uh, which I think is a great question because, you know, so many of our kids are on successful prophylaxis now, thank goodness. But, um, you know, so they may go months and months with not having a, a physical, you know, health impairment, but you never know, you know, next week, next month. So the question was, these can be temporary limitations? Well, they might be temporary, but as, you, as it is within the figure, everything's so infrequent, not predictable, you've got to be ready for it. So this plan that puts in place, looks at the big picture of saying, well, you know, usually has a bleed in this area joint, and when that happens, and we hope it doesn't happen this year, but last year it was really bad, and we missed a lot of school. So it's in place. It's just like having that intermittent homebound. You hope you don't have to use it, but if you've got documentation that you have needed it in the past, then it can be there for that reason. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, next slide. Okay, so the next one is the special ed law, and it provides educational services that are direct and specialized instruction by a teacher that has background in special ed, and it is for kids that are age 3 to 21. I'll do the next slide. And IDA, that's the name of it, Individual Disability Education Act, covers 13 disability categories. And to be eligible to receive the service, the child's hemophilia condition must be determined to adversely affect his educational performance. So next slide. So here are the different categories. And most of the time, the children that I have talked to and worked with, with the families and adults, um, and excuse me, school staff, um, other health impaired is the most likely way to be able to get uh, services under IDEA. Of course, the children with hemophilia can also have a learning disability or uh, have a developmental disability as well. But for the other health impaired, it's been the main way that children with hemophilia get special education. So it has to be having limited vitality. Let me read that. A limited vitality or alertness, including a heightened alertness to environmental stimuli that result in limited alertness to the educational environment. That is due to chronic or acute health problems such as ADHD hemophilia that adversely affects a child's educational performance. So if the child is really, really far behind or is having a very difficult time in, at school achieving um, because they're out a lot or um, they're anxious or in pain, you know, it could be a reason to ask for a meeting to look at the possibility of having an IEP. Unlike the 504, the 504 is just a team and it usually is much more simpler um, to get. Um, there has to be a, usually a team intervention first that the, the teacher and um, a few other people like the psychologist will meet and talk about trying to get strategies that would help the child. And then the, if they did need, if they found they did need intervention, then they'd call for a 504 meeting and they would write the plan right then. But for um, other health impaired, a special education, you go through a much more involved process. Those of you that have had an IP, and I saw at the beginning a lot that many people had. Um, so, you know, you, uh, the teacher has to fill out a lot of questionnaires, the school psychologist observes the child, does a lot of pretty rigorous testing and evaluation, uh, and then basically you've got to prove that, um, or have indicators that hemophilia is adversely affecting his educational performance and he needs to have some type of special ed support. You'll go to the next. And so it could be um, itinerant resource or self-contained. So the itinerant model is where you just have a special ed consultant that works with the regular teacher um, or maybe works with the child in the regular classroom briefly, but there's no pullout. 
there's the resource, is an actual pullout where the special ed teacher takes the child from one hour or 45 minutes up to three uh, with a special ed teacher. Then self-contained, of course, the child spends all day in the special education class except the um, classes that he goes to for or she goes to for inclusion with art, music, PE. So these are delivery models for IDA. Jane, do you want to stop and ask if there's any questions? Or um, sure. Are there any I, if anybody, I mean, up? people have been pretty good about yeah about sending them in through the question box. So um, mm -hmm. I think that method is going. And as, as, as much as I would love to open the microphones, because this is such a great topic to just have a good discussion about, um, right. you know, we have learned in the past that it really just doesn't work with, right. with the background noise and the delay in audio. So, um, but I, I will encourage people to please, if you have questions or comments, um, tips or anything you want to share, please use that question box. Okay, so um, we're looking at just the difference, just to recap, between 504 and IDA. 504 is a civil rights law. It says you can't discriminate against children with uh, chronic health conditions or, or um, because of race or culture, um, whereas IDA is a special education law. It's a federal law. Well, both actually are federal laws. Um, and the 504 provides modification to regular education uh, by having those accommodations in the classroom with an extra set of books or lockers down low or extra time to get to class if they're on um, crutches or have, have a bleed. Whereas IDA, IDA provides special education service um, and, and does pull out. Um, the 504 does not require a written plan, but best practice is to have one. With IDA, it's a long, uh, rather complex um, package of information uh, that requires a written plan with evaluation and annual goals. So with the 504, it has to be written every year. An IEP also has to be written every year if the child changes and the needs of the child changes. You can go to the and next Joby, one. we have a, a couple of questions came in. The first was that, can you have a 504 with an IEP? That's a good question, but no. So um, the IEP would would indicate uh, everything is needed at that level. So you, anything that's in the 504 can be rolled into the IT. You know, if you need the second set of books or, um, you know, or extra time in class, that would be put in the IP in addition to helping the child academically with the subject he's, he or she's not doing well. Great. And we actually had a second question on that, with, on that same topic that, um, should they make sure they have both or no? So it sounds like once you once you get the IEP, that includes what might be under the 504. Right. And you know, we always go with less is best. If you can write a 504 that really gets at what the child needs, it's best because um, you know he's in the classroom more. When you have to start pulling out with IDA, you've kind of got to decide well which class is he going to be pulled out of, and it's much more. Um, much more involved. And remember, with the individual education plan, there might be a way that the child doesn't even need a 504. You can have the, it covered under the health plan. So you've, you've got a lot of options. But for sure, the IEP supersedes 504. You don't need a 504 when you have an IEP. Yeah. Uh, another uh, interesting question um, from a parent uh, said, uh, my first grader was pushed four or five times last year during recess on the playground, causing substantial bleeding to knees and elbows. Um, can they ask that their son be assigned a paraprofessional to watch him specifically on the playground? Goodness, I know that was upsetting to, to happen. I'm sorry to hear about that. Um, well, you can always ask. However, um, getting a paraprofessional now, one-on-one -on -one with any child, even real children with real severe disabilities, is very hard because they just don't have the money. But it sounds like that um, you know, teachers are supposed to be watching, uh, that there needs to be better supervision there. Um, and also, perhaps, I, I've found that going to the school and doing in-services, that when children are being teased or uh, like in your situation, being abused, really being hit, 
when kids find out about what this is and when you have your, the child with the bleeding disorder being part of the explanation, showing the puppet or whatever, um, a lot of children show more compassion it's when they don't know and they're ignorant. Um, so I'm real big on um, if, if the child feels like self-disclosing to be able to have the nurse or the teacher or somebody from the hospital or the parent go and let the children talk about it. Let, let them, they're, they're usually afraid. So giving them that knowledge to me brings out the best in other children. Okay, we'll, we'll just go on to the next slide then. Um, so ADA, so that's the Americans with Disability Act. And again, it's the civil rights law that prohibits discrimination. And basically, it's to be used in uh, employment. So you can't um, discriminate against anyone for, as we're talking about, um, bleeding disorders. And you're not required to tell your employer uh, when they're interviewing you. That's against the law for them to ask if you do have any kind of chronic health condition. So you don't have to reveal that. Joby, may I ask a question on that? So if you have yes. a, um, if, if you have an IEP instead of a 504, mm -hmm. and then you go off to college where mm -hmm. IEPs don't exist, um, right. can you can you kind of go back? Like if you if I, I feel like because this is actually my own son's experience, um, sure. that he went to college without a 504 because in his senior year of high school they switched him over to an IEP. So can we huh. go back now? Can we kind of go backwards and say now we want to get back in the 504 world? Yeah. Absolutely, you can come back, and that that would be a, a real smart thing to do, because like you say, you never know when you need it. But if he had an IEP, that that means he needs accommodation, so it's not a problem. But like you say, the colleges do not have uh, IEPs, but they do have ADA, Amer Americans with Disability Act, and they do have Section 504 if they take federal money. So he could easily go back. Um, and every college that receives money has a Section 504 coordinator at the college. All right, and we have a, um, and so, and do you need to have a 504 in college to kind of follow you into employment? What do you mean by that? I didn't, I didn't understand. You can have a 504 with your employer, isn't that correct? No. Um, Oh, that is only for colleges, but the, okay. the, you're you're protected in employment by the ADA. That you okay. can't like if I needed a special computer because I had uh, severe problems, you know, with fine litter or something. They they would have to get you a special computer, or if you had to bleed and you had to use the elevators or you know whatever. Um, so the ADA would go with employment, but the Section 504 would go with colleges, and the ADA can go with colleges as well. All right. And and another question from the audience on the ADA: uh, Does that affect the rights of the parents or the care providers in terms of health care and needs for their jobs? I'm not sure if I understand, but you know there is that. Um, and I thought I had that on the slide, and I can't remember. Is um, What is the act that par parents are taking care of their families have, that leave time, two weeks, is it? Oh, yeah, the weeks? family medical leave? Yeah, family medical leave. So I forgot to mention that, because a lot of families don't really use that, but need it uh, to keep their jobs. But um, I'm not sure I understood what the question was. Well, I think it was if, if, you're, if your young child is the one with the disability, um, but you know, mom or dad needs to take time off work or has other, you know, conflicts with their job. Would the child's disability in any way, you know, would the ADA in any way benefit or the parent? So the child has a disability, well, yes. not the parent. Well, yes. But the parent's challenges at work are the result of the child's disability. Right, right. And I think, um, you know, I can remember being at the hospital when a lot of times nurses or health people would call um, on behalf of the parent uh, to explain to the employer, you know, what the situation is at school and why she needs to be away and that kind of thing. But
but I do know that the Medical Leave Act does allow parents to take X amount of days, but there is a finite number of days that you can take. Right. So that's tough. Okay. Right, Thank you. Time. So yeah. So it sounds like you, yeah. there, there's really no legal protection for parents of children with disabilities. Um, just, just hopefully a compassionate employer and a, right. and a treatment, a right. treatment after, center that will get they, on the phone and explain to your yeah. employer what's going on. And after they've taken their leave days, yeah, I think that's yeah. it. Thank you. Next slide. Okay, I think I already been over that. Okay, next slide. All right, well, I do have um, a child just for us to take a look at, and uh, his name is Maurice, and he's in the fourth grade, and he has severe hemophilia, factor A deficiency. He also has some mild problems with attention and low motivation to complete his schoolwork. He's been absent from school a lot, um, and his homebound instruction has been inconsistent. So I want you to think about this child for a few minutes, and um, what recommendations would you suggest for Maurice? So if you would, again, you can go back to the other slide for a minute and let him take a look at it. And Joby, unfortunately, we don't have this one in as a poll question. Right, that's fine, that's fine. Yeah. We'll just work through this. Okay, so I... Uh, wrote down a few things that I would think about and, and see if you came up with some or different. But I'd first ask Maurice, you know, how are things going? And I think as parents, we that's one of the best things we can do, I don't care what age they are, is to just ask, how are you doing? Uh, and do it in a time when you relax, you know, and when the child's happy or, um, you know, everything's going good, not when things are going bad. Cause it's often hard to, to have those kind of conversations. But to be able to really listen and ask, um, you know, how or what questions again. If you ask um, yes or no questions, you, you know, you're going to get yes or no. Do you like school? Yes or no. Uh, how, were, were you, did you have fun today? Yes or no. But if you ask, well, you know, how, how are things going? Which teacher is your favorite teacher? When is it that you um, become most restless, that you have trouble paying attention? Is it math or English or you know, so try to get as much from the child as you can, and of course talk to the teacher to get more information and ask her to call a team intervention meeting. And that's the first thing you do before you look at having a 504. It's just the team gets together, sometimes without the parent, just to see if they can come up with some pretty simple strategies in the classroom. And you could get the exact number of homebound absences. Um, does he have any incompletes that he's failing because uh, there's work that he hasn't turned in? A lot of times parents aren't aware of it, the specifics on that. You can call the HTC and ask them to help you uh, get the absences approved. Um, you can get the school nurse involved. That, that person really needs to be your main, main advocate um, to see is there a place that the child can stay where they can take maybe pain medicine and rest so they can get back in school and not have to leave school. Um, again, do they need a 504? Do they need to be tested? Um, could it be that Maurice is, is a little depressed? Does he seem to be depressed? When did it begin? Does he have friends? Um, maybe get Maurice to chart his days to see how many he's missing. A lot of times kids aren't really aware of the number of days they really have missed. Certainly. I'm big on getting them into hemophilia groups uh, that do the retreats and go to the organizational meetings and uh, just to have a support group. Um, you might could get into emailing weekly um, with a little rewards for Maurice working hard in school. So again, there's no finite list. It's a matter of getting in there, rolling up your shirt sleeves and, and working as a team to help figure out what's going on with Maurice and, and be able to support him. I wish I could hear you. I just want to mention, yeah, I know, and, and unfortunately, Joby, we're, we're, we're right almost at 9 o'clock. We can certainly oh. go after 9, and but I just want okay. to let you know you have about 10 slides left. So okay, I, oh goodness. Okay, well most of them are for teenagers. 
So in a way, that's good that there's not many, um, there weren't many teenagers on here. But let's turn to how would you or your child answer these questions? See if you can find that slide that's right at the end, and we'll end up. And while we're moving to that slide, I just want to thank everybody for the comments on um, the Family Leave Act and, and the questions. I, I think we may have confused people a little bit. Yes, the, the uh, Family Medical Leave Act does cover um, you know, parents and children and siblings and all. It is the, it's the ADA, American with Disabilities Act, that only covers the child with the disability and uh, oh, one of the moms. Yeah. Yeah, and one of the moms commented that she's actually been going through this herself over the last year um, and um, at, at work and that uh, she's had to go to the FMLA, which only covers about 12 weeks per year. Right. So, okay. Um, Thank you. And it's helpful. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, I, I realize we're, let's just go to the last one on resiliency and then we can call it a night. Okay, so the last slide is resiliency. And children with chronic health conditions, since they are at greater risk for adjustment difficulties, it's really important that they realize that, um, that you know, in addition, life is hard, that they have opportunities to bound back and um, to be able to um, know that, that they can have an impact on, on their life, that, that when things are tough, they can have a lot of support. They can ask for support, um, especially during transitions. And um, I know there was this one little boy that um, was having a lot of trouble, and um, he ended up um, showing so much resourcefulness because we were camping out in the woods in Tennessee, and I had driven a big school bus up there, and we were staying in an old log cabin, and they couldn't wait. The next morning, we were waking up real early to go rafting, and everybody was so excited. So the next morning, I got the van already. We got all packed up. I turned the ignition, and nothing. Turned it again, nothing. And we were all about to give up. And this little boy named Cody, he was probably about 12 years old, uh, he's, he's real Southern. He said, don't worry, Miss Joby. I'll go get us some power. What, power, what do you call it to start the car? Um, oh, gosh, the battery chargers. Battery chargers. Power steering? So no, the battery charge, where it charged the battery. He took off in the woods. I thought, where in the world is Cody going? You know, there he is, running through the woods for a battery charger. And within 10 minutes, that boy came back. He said, I'm, I told you I'd find him. So I don't know where he got him, but to me that was just the perfect example of, of saying, you know, no problem cannot be solved if we all work together. And um, I want to say I enjoyed talking with y'all tonight. I wish I could have had the interaction, I'm sure I would have learned a lot. But thank you very much for inviting me, Jane. I appreciate it. Oh, thank you, Joby, so much. And I'm, I, I want to let everybody know that um, we, we will make um, a PDF, you know, document of the slides. So those last few slides, I think that list of questions look really interesting. So if that caught your, your eye and your curiosity, we will email to you. Um, copies of this of these slides and if you have any questions I, I'm sure we could direct them to Joby um, there's also great resources within HFA I uh, want to tell you about one in particular that Sanja and I have been working on uh, that we're pretty excited about we're going to be launching later this week uh, is a back-to-school toolkit very very practical hands-on there are samples of 504 plans in there there are some real plans uh, you know not just the, the empty template but real plans with the names blacked out of kids in elementary school and high school who have hemophilia. Um, we're both moms, and I think we've learned that um, some of our best tips and advice comes from other parents and seeing what families are, are doing in their own lives. Um, there's a sample individual health care plan. There's a list of possible accommodations you might want to put on your 504 plan, all very specific to hemophilia. Um, there's also a great document since we have so many uh, elementary school kids because it's a little bit on the younger side, but it's called uh, My Bleeding Disorder. And you can download it and fill in the fields with your kids' information. And it's just a very user-friendly way for you to share information um, about your child's bleeding disorder uh, with teachers or coaches or scout leaders or babysitters or parents you know, of your kids' friends. 
um, kind of gives them in a nutshell the, the what they need to know in a, in a very easy to understand format. So we will shoot you an email later in the week when that's available, but it will be on um, on Hemophilia Federation of America's website, which is www.hemophiliafed.org. Uh, very excited about it. We would love to hear your feedback because, as I said, some of the best advice and tips and recommendations come from you all, so we'd love to hear your feedback. Our next webinar is October 15th on Building Strong Families. Uh, Dr. David Robinson is a family and marriage therapist. He also has two sons with hemophilia, so he brings great perspective from both the personal side and the professional side. And just before we leave, I, um, I, I want to make sure you all know about HFA has a fabulous fundraiser that's coming up next month called Gears for Good. Uh, it's a charity bike ride that takes place from West Virginia to D.C. Um, and there are three ways that you can be involved. You can register for the ride and join the group that, that is out there doing the 156 miles, which may sound daunting, but I've been told from, you know, from the, the savvy cyclist to, honestly, the mom who kind of sort of works out and decided she was going to do this, that it is a very doable ride. It's spaced out over three days. It's flat terrain. Um, it's just a wonderful opportunity to get to connect. There's a lot of the older guys, the Blood Brothers, participate in this. I know as a mom of a 20-year-old, to be able to spend time with those adult guys and learn from them is huge. So that's one way. If you can't make it down to D.C., um, you can be a virtual rider, and you can uh, go onto our, our website and find, you know, find the, the tab for Gears for Good and, and just do your riding locally or you can always uh, just donate to the cause. And 100% of the funds raised for Gear, Gears for Good goes to HFA's Helping Hands program, uh, and that offers financial assistance to families uh, and individuals with a bleeding disorder who are you know, having some temporary struggles due to their bleeding disorder. So the Helping Hands is able to help them out in a financial way, and all the money raised from Gears for the Good will go to Helping Hands. So uh, thank you very much. Thanks for all the great questions. Um, please feel free to contact us anytime at HFA programs at hemophiliafed.org. And um, we look forward to hopefully having you join us in October. Thank you so much, Joby, and thank for you. your help on the tech side, Sanja. Good, Good night, everybody. Good night.